Well, good morning, church. I hope you are well. You can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. And to those joining online, just want to say welcome. And uh, we're so glad that you're able to tune in with us. Um, Before we jump into our text, uh, I just want to explain a little bit about the missions banquet. I've had people say, well, what is this about? Is this for me? Uh, What what do we do? And uh, missions is a key part of New Hope. And uh, if you've been around for very long, you're going to hear us ringing that bell pretty loud because we believe in the Great Commission where Jesus says, go unto unto all the world preaching and teaching, making disciples, sharing the good news, baptizing. And uh, so as we give above our tithes and offerings, we give to missions. And so missions is important, but part of uh, missions is being unified in purpose and vision for what we need to accomplish. And so at the missions banquet, uh, we hold this every year and we come together as a church family. And it's incredible to have 700 or more people show up under one roof to eat a meal together and we get to hear from an amazing speaker who will share about the needs that are going across Europe as Europe has grown very dark but also about the wonderful things that God is doing in Europe and then how we can be a part of that and so uh, I would encourage you if you've never been a part of one of our missions banquets make it a priority to come Uh, I would say most people return year after year and it's it's a great event to uh, be a part of. Matthew chapter 21 is where our text today as we celebrate Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the uh, Sunday before Easter. It's the Sunday that took place just prior to Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. And this event is recorded in all four of the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And I would challenge you and encourage you this week as a homework assignment. Read through the triumphal entry is what it might be called in your Bible. Read through this entry um, of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, in all four of the Gospels this week. And you'll begin to see similarities, but also different details that each of the Gospels uh, highlight and bring to attention through, as different people see things. In the same way, if you're a witness of an accident, you're going to see things from a different perspective and you're going to highlight something, but you're all recording the same event. And so I would challenge you to, to make that a priority this week, reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this text. Matthew 21, starting in verse 1, and uh, I'm going to ask you to stand. It's been, you've been on your bums for a while, and uh, I know that blood flow is good. If, if you can, if you can't, I understand that is okay. Let's read God's word, starting in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Beth- Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the full of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Verse 8, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut palm branches, or cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And God, we just pause just for a moment. And I ask that your spirit would speak to us. God, that that we would not glaze over this as just one more Palm Sunday of our lives, but we would allow your sweet, gentle Holy Spirit that convicts us, that saves us, that draws us closer to you, that we would allow your Spirit to speak to our hearts, to our minds, 
I pray against all distractions, Jesus, that notifications and phones and what's to come and, and later today or, or this week, God, I just, just lay those aside and we ask that you would speak to us through your word by the quickening of your Holy Spirit to our hearts, God. We love you. We ask these things in your faithful name, Jesus. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Title of my message this morning is, Who is this? Turn to your neighbor and say, Who is this? It's the question that everyone was asking, and it's the most important question that you can ask yourself about Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? Is he your friend? Is he your savior? Is he your master? Is he your Lord? Is he loving father? Is he healer, the person of peace? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who is this? Who is Jesus? And the truth is, is that we've already answered the question one way or another. All you have to do is look at the way that you respond to Jesus to know how you view Jesus. See, because the way you view Jesus influences the way that you respond to Jesus. Is he more than just your friend? Is he more than just gracious and full of mercy and love? Is he also just? Is he also ruler? I think of Revelation when he comes again and there's fire in his eyes. We like to sing about the love in his eyes, right? And we should sing about the love in his eyes for it's his love that draws us in. But who is Jesus? It's my heart's desire that we as a church grow in a fuller and complete understanding of the person of Jesus Christ. Not just fixating on one thing, because if we fixate on just that he is Lord and he is master and he is supreme and he's got all authority and and he's righteous ruler and he's gonna judge, that can lead us into this fear-based relationship where we're afraid of our Lord and we begin to obey him because we see him as this man with a sword coming from his mouth and fire in his eyes and and it's it's terrifying. But if we if we spend too much time focusing on his mercy and his love and, and just all all of his forgiveness, then, then we can take that for granted and there's a balance. It, it, we, we need to see Jesus in the entirety of his person and his character. And this morning, I would just ask you, who is Jesus to you? Do you see him for all that he is? There's a song and I've sung it here before but it's a simple prayer. Open my eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, and say that I love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open my eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Jesus, that is our heart's desire, to see you. To not just see an aspect of you, Lord, but to see all of you. I don't want to settle for just recognizing just a portion of who Jesus is. May we grow in understanding of who he is. Let's spend a little time walking through our text and see just how people saw Jesus back then. Starting in verse 1 said this, as they approached Jerusalem and they came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives. So this is, this is a stone's throw away from Jerusalem. How many have been to Israel, right? And, and there's two valleys that, that have the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives is just a few hundred yards away. He sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Unite them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the, say that the who? Say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Jesus, for the first time, identifies himself as Lord. See, up until this point in time, every time Jesus does a miracle, he's like, hush, 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 don't, don't tell people. The time has not yet come, 
right? He, he's got this timeline on his mind. There's prophecies that have to be fulfilled from Daniel. There's, there's different things that he's in tune with because he's in tune with the Father. He's in tune because he is God in flesh. And he's always been hush-hush about his ministry and his true identity. But he tells his disciples that he is the Lord. The Lord needs it. And so how do they respond to Jesus saying, yes, I am the Messiah. I am the Lord. Well, let's jump to verse 6 and 7. It says that the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. It's obvious in our text that Jesus' disciples must have viewed Jesus as Lord. Jesus um, had just finished raising Lazarus from the dead. They had just come from this miraculous event where a man had been dead for four days and Jesus raised him back to life. These disciples had spent the last three years with Jesus, seeing with their own eyes healings, the, the mute talking, the deaf hearing, the blind seeing, the lame walking, the demon possessed being set free, and they had walked and they had seen miracle after miracle. They had seen with just a word the power that this man had. They knew and they believed and they were convinced in their hearts that Jesus was Lord. Their view wasn't based off of a textbook. It was personal. They had seen and experienced enough and were convinced for themselves that Jesus was Messiah. If it had been anybody else that says, I'm the Lord, they may have stoned them for blasphemous talk. If it had been anybody else who said, it's the Lord, the Lord needs it, they may have just laughed it off and ignored it. But they had seen, they had tasted, they had, they had walked with Jesus and they were fully convinced. Let me ask you this, church. Is your view of Jesus just textbook? Meaning, have, have you just seen Jesus through the word of God? And trust me, that is the main and primary way that, that God reveals himself is through the word of God. But there's also a personal element to it. Where, where the Holy Spirit of God comes and he quickens the word of God, meaning he makes that come alive and bear witness in our hearts. Is Jesus more than just a person in history to you? Is he actually your Lord, your Savior, your lover, the bridegroom, the person of peace? Has it become personal to you? Because to his disciples, it was personal. They loved Jesus. They were close to Jesus. And we see that their view of Jesus led them to a place of obedience. Verse 6, they go and they borrow some person's colt. John's account said that they didn't understand why they were getting the colt, yet they still obeyed. John 12, 16, they didn't understand these things until he had been glorified, yet they still obeyed. How obedient are you to? to God's word in your life. Could, could it be that our view of Jesus isn't full or accurate? I, I, I've been just stewing on this question. What would happen if we slowed down enough to actually look upon the person of Jesus? Because the more we get to know him, the more that we'll love him, the easier it will be to trust him and obey him. But oftentimes, we live in such a fast-paced manner and a lifestyle that we have lost sight of who Jesus really is. We're getting walk-bys, which is like, hey God, it's Sunday, God. Hey, it's good to see you. Hey, it's Wednesday. It's Bible study. Instead of just being a Mary where we just sit at his feet, say, God, I wanna see your face. I don't want to just know that you're a redeemer. I don't want to just know that, that you're a holy father. I don't want to just know that you love. I want to experience it. I want to slow down and see you and be convicted with everything in me that, that you love me, that, that you are holy. Are you living today too fast to truly see the person of Jesus Christ? Many of you are married, some of you are not, but imagine with me that you're married. A relationship doesn't work just going, just constantly just 
pass by conversations. Hey, how are you doing? Pick up the kids, get the milk. We're, we're, I'll see you at practice, okay? Doesn't work that way. Hey, can you do this? I got that. Okay, that sounds good. I'll see you later. You know how a real beautiful marriage works is when you just sit down in the presence and there's, you're not in a rush. You talk. You take time to listen and see the other person's heart. When was the last time that you slowed down enough to see the heart of Jesus Christ? To get a fuller picture and sight of who he is. When we take time to see Jesus, I believe that it leads to the fear of the Lord. We see him as loving and we see him as merciful, but it also leads to the fear of the Lord and not in a a fearful, like, I'm afraid of you way, but but one where it says, I I take you seriously, God. I, 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 I'm gonna take you at your word. We recognize and we submit to his reign and his rule as king. Scripture says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. In Isaiah, it talks about Jesse's root and it says his treasure will be the fear of the Lord. Jesus' treasure was the fear of the Lord. Now it's not saying I'm afraid of my father. It's saying I, I, lo- I see everything that he is. And I respect that, and I follow that. See, the fear of the Lord manifests in obedience in five different ways. John Brevere says it manifests to obey him instantly, to obey him even if it doesn't make sense, to obey him even if it hurts, and even if we don't see the benefit, and to obey him to completion. Ask yourself this morning, is this the way that your obedience is manifested towards God. And if not, I just humbly submit, maybe your view of the Lord isn't complete or full or accurate. Trust me, I'm not perfect in this. The temptation of going fast is there daily. I've got three young children. I've got a wife. I've got a job. I understand the demands of life, but I've also come to understand that there is no one sweeter than the presence of Jesus Christ. And as I prioritize him, that he supplies all of my needs. For as we seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, all of these things will be added unto you. Help us, God, to truly see you In order to have this kind of obedience, we must first see God accurately. We must see all of who Jesus is. That's, I really believe, the reason why his disciples could and would obey him is that they knew Jesus completely and intimately. This uh, past spring break, uh, many of you know I like mountain biking. And uh, Sam does too. And I got to take Sam and uh, his, his friend Judah and, and his, his dad Brian. And you can throw the picture up of us. We, we went down to Bentonville. And it was supposed to be warm. I've been down to Bentonville over spring break a few times now. And it's always 65 and sunny. It was a real feel of 16 on Friday morning. And uh, let's just say I was praying to the Lord that he would give me joy. (laughs) I was glad to be with Sam, but I was not happy to be outside on a bike, freezing my fingers, and uh, they had a blast. My son is in the blue helmet, um, and then his buddy Judah in the Iowa, by the way, go Hawkeyes this afternoon, and um, and then Brian, and then I'm on the left, um, and we're standing in front of a helicopter that the boys get to ride their bikes through down at runway, and we were, we were down there, and uh, we get on this trail that I had wanted to check out because I'd, I watched a, you know, a video on it, and it seemed like a, a mild trail. I'm like, Sam, you can handle this totally. I went the wrong way. I went the uphill way, and I went to the back technical side, meaning lots of rocks and roots and different things, and, and I, I knew he could do the majority of this trail, and this trail's name is dumb. It's Tatamaguchi. It's just 
I should have just been like, that's a dumb name. I, I shouldn't even go on this trail. But we're back on this trail, and, and, and Sam just gets to this point, and Judah both. They get to this point. It's like, oh, why are we on this trail? And they wanted to, like, sit down on the trail. And I'm like, guys, we, we can't go back. We have to go forward. Like, do you trust your dad? Like, Sam, and, you know, I had this conversation. He's kind of wiping tears away, and, and it's cold, and it's not fun, and, and we're on this trail, and I'm kind of pushing him a little bit um, as, as some fathers. Any other father ever pushed their children a little bit and stuff like that, okay? Some of these, these dads are like this, <laughs> raising their hands. And, and uh, he's kind of wiping tears away, and I said, Sam, do you know that Daddy loves you? Yeah. Would I ever lead you to a place that's unsafe? Am I ever going to let you do something that is going to lead you to hurting yourself? No. A- 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 am I going to be with you? Am I going to help you on this trail? Yeah. Do you think that we can finish this together, you and me together? Yeah, yeah, I do. And, and, and Sam, in this moment, he had this decision to make. Am I going to fully trust my dad based upon his character and what I know of him, or am I just going to sit down and I'm just going to call it quits? Uh, my, my daughter, Essie, um, she, she loves food, but there's no food on earth that she loves more than mac and cheese. I'm not kidding you. She ate mac and cheese for breakfast yesterday. Not because we made it. Okay, don't judge me. I'm not making craft mac and cheese for my kids for breakfast, but because there were some leftovers. And she asks every meal for mac and cheese. Drives me nuts. You go out to eat. Can I get mac and cheese? No, I'm not paying six bucks for craft mac and cheese. What are you, think I'm crazy? We're getting steak, baby, you know? <laughs> she asks all the time. And I, I, there's times where we're, where we put the food in, in our household, we, we just say, what we make is what you get. You can either go hungry, you know, they're not going to starve themselves, but you can, you can go hungry or you can uh, eat what we're going to eat. And my wife is very um, good about making sure that there's protein and there's vegetables and it's a balanced, healthy meal and stuff. And sometimes the stuff she makes, I'm like, well, that's interesting, you know, and I'm thinking the same thing, but I'm like, kids, <laughs> eat this, <laughs> you know. And we have this conversation constantly with our children. Would I feed you something bad? You know, have I ever intentionally hurt you? Is, is what daddy is trying to feed you something healthy? Well, yeah. Is it something good for you? Yeah. And, and we have to remind our children of our character. Now, I'm a flawed parent. My wife is a flawed parent. I'm far from being a perfect father. But all of my kids are developing a greater understanding of who I am as their father. And as their understanding of who I am and their trust in my character grows, their complete and total obedience matures. It's not wrapped up only in my authority. It's wrapped up in my love. Do you see that? It's not just the authority of I'm dad and you're going to do this because I'm dad and you're under my thumb and you're under my household. It's also wrapped up in their confidence and my love for them. It's the whole picture of who I am. And I'm, I'm, I'm not comparing myself to God here because I understand I'm imperfect. But, but have, have you spent enough time with your heavenly father to, go, to grow in understanding of his character and to begin to truly trust his heart. That when he asks you to go get a donkey, that you would just go do it. When he asks you at missions convention to write a check that goes beyond what the budget says, that you would do it. That when he tells you to go to that person who really ought to be apologizing to you, but you apologize to them and you get on your cross and you die and you ask for forgiveness even when you've done 1% wrong and they've done 99% wrong, that you trust them and you respond in obedience. See, the disciples spent three years daily spending time with Jesus. 
Weekend encounters are not enough. It's a daily discipline of discovering Christ through the scriptures and through spending time in worship and prayer and listening. A personal relationship with Jesus prevents us from slipping into either extreme, in, in the extreme of his mercy and grace or the extreme of him being ruler and judge. He is both. I should just say he is. He is both fire and love in his eyes, both merciful and just. And as our view of Jesus changes, our response of, to Jesus changes. In the same way, I've heard people say, man, I wish, I, you know, I'm 25 years old now, and I just, I, I started to realize mom and dad knew what they were talking about. And it's like this fuller understanding of mom and dad and the whys of what they're doing. And I've seen a lot of these parents that have like empty nesters or looking at their parents like smirking, like, yep, just heard that, you know. But it's this, this fuller understanding as we mature and we continue to walk life that leads to this place of trust and influence. Is your relationship with the Lord personal? As our view of Jesus changes, our response to him will too. Let's continue verse eight and nine. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and while others cut branches, these are palm branches and the other gospels, from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So who is this crowd? We talk about this crowd. Well, one, this crowd is not the same crowd that convicts him and crucifies him and, and, and shouts crucify him. This is, these are different. That happened at night. Those were the religious leaders. That was people that were a part of This is a different crowd. But within this crowd, um, this is happening during the Passover festival. Now, what is the Passover festival? The, the, it's remembering God delivering Israel from captivity of the Egyptians. And Jews from all over traveling to Jerusalem came to celebrate the Passover, to remember that God had delivered them from the oppression and the slavery of the Egyptians. Now, John chapter 12, you can turn there if you want, or you can just take my word for it. But in verse 16, it says that his disciples were a part of this crowd. Verse 17, it says, those who are with him when he raised Lazarus from the dead just previously were a part of this crowd. It says that those, in verse 18, those who had heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead were a part of this crowd. In verse 19, it says that the Pharisees were a part of this crowd. And all four of those people were viewing Jesus through a different lens. Now remember that this event of Jesus riding on this colt, coming into Jerusalem, the palm branches coming down, the cloaks being laid out, this event is happening leading up to the festival of Passover, being delivered from Egypt. And this theme of deliverance was already on this crowd's mind. It was already on their minds. And just 200 years earlier, a man named Maccabeus, whose his nickname was The Hammer. How cool is that? Like, that'd be a great nickname. You're The Hammer. Okay, I could never have that nickname. I don't have big enough muscles for that. Um, but a, a man named Maccabeus led a Jewish revolt and overthrew the Syrians and led Israel to independence and, and being free again. And he adopted, what does he adopt? As the sign of victory and Israeli uh, independence, the palm branch. He adopts this, this sign, this palm branch, as a sign of victory. Now, I want you to picture with me, as the crowd who already had deliverance on their mind due to the festival of Passover, they're already thinking about deliverance. And as this crowd is seeing Jesus come, they lay down their cloaks, which was a sign of submitting to lordship and, and to royalty. And they waved palm branches, which was a symbol of victory and independence. And they shouted, Hosanna, which means save us or save now. They had no idea that they were asking to be saved from the wrong enemy. The crowd and even the disciples at this point, even the disciples at this point, because John chapter 12, verse 16 says they didn't understand this. They viewed Jesus as Messiah but they didn't understand the true purpose of the Messiah. They thought that he had come to lead another revolt. They thought he was going to deliver them from their earthly 
oppressors. It wasn't to save them from the Romans. The Messiah came to save them from themselves. They failed to recognize that the greatest threat wasn't their surroundings, but their greatest threat lived on the inside of their hearts. Jesus came to save the world from the power of sin that so easily entangles us. That's why Jesus weeps in the Luke account of this. And he stands and he says, if you only knew, if you only knew what you were saying, if you only knew, he weeps because he understands that they're worshiping Jesus because they viewed him as Messiah, but they didn't understand it. It wasn't a complete picture. Do you worship the Lord for the right reason? For who he is? Is your prayer consistently, God save me from this political party, or from my coworkers, or from the evil in this world, or from the evil in our schools or the workplace, or is it God save me from myself? God save me from the sin and the greed and the anger and the lust and the pride that lies within me. See, 2,000 years ago, Satan was winning because he got all the religious people to focus on all the evil in other people's lives rather than focusing on the evil that lived inside them so much that they forgot the primary reason why the Christ would come. They forgot the primary reason why Messiah would come. Let's not repeat history. Are you crying out to God, save me for the right reason? Are you worshiping God because you've truly seen him? I think that the temptation is, is that the longer you walk with the Lord, and please hear my heart in this church. As I was praying over here before service, I felt like this was just pressed heavily on my heart. So I, I want you to hear, please, with me this morning. The longer that we walk with the Lord, the, 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 um, better and more fruit that we produce. And then it's easy to say, well, I'm, I'm doing really good and our actions are, are like um, good and our fruit becomes good. But then we just kind of pause in our moment of holiness where it says, well, our actions and what we're doing is good, but we don't allow the spirit of God to refine our thoughts. We don't allow the Spirit of God to refine our motives of what, why we are doing what we are doing. And I think that the longer that we walk with the Lord and the more secure we feel and just kind of our, our you know, cleansing bath or whatever, the easier it is to look out to the world and become more concerned about the world's issues and we tend to just allow the remaining sin in our life just to exist. We, we put the continuation of sanctification, the process of being holy on pause because we see the evil that prevails in this world. Would you just allow the spirit of God in this moment to just speak to your heart, God, am I more concerned about other people's evilness than the evil that still lies within my own heart? Scripture says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And I feel that in today's church culture, we spend a lot of time praying for holiness around us because we want revival, because we want to see the face of the Lord, and God is saying, let's start with you. You want to see me. I, I don't need to clean up Johnson and Ank. I need to clean up you. As musicians come, I want to close with this thought. That worship took place because of how the disciples and the crowd viewed Jesus. They viewed him as Messiah and therefore 
they worshiped him. But even though they didn't fully know or understand exactly in perfect revelation of who Jesus was, it led to their worship. Many of those in the crowd who are worshiping were doing so out of relationship. They had spent time with Jesus. They knew him well because they had invested time with him. But now today, what does this mean for us today in this now? It means that we have no excuse to not respond to him correctly. And not just out of an intellectual textbook way. Because we have the full picture of Christ. In, in John chapter 12, verse 16, it says it wasn't until after all these events that the disciples understood these things. When I read that, I thought to myself, thank goodness that I'm not the only one. <laughs> there have been many things that didn't make sense to me at first about God's word, about his character, about his nature. And then it was five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road where I began to fully understand who he was. Thank goodness that I'm not the only one. But now we don't have an excuse because the word of God clearly lays it out before us, all of who Jesus was. You say, well, how do I know him personally? That's where I was talking about early, earlier. The spirit of God coming in and making the word of God come alive so that it actually becomes truth and not just some history book. It doesn't just become another story in our minds. you stand with me we're, we're going to end in a time of worship here but before we do I want you just to allow the spirit of God to speak to your hearts ask, ask yourself this is the way that I view Jesus more factual or is it more intimate Is the way that I view Jesus more because of I, I know about him or is it because I actually know him? Ask yourself this and to tune out all distractions. That's why we close our eyes. Does my response to the Lord reflect how I really feel about him? I feel that there might be many people in this room that need to be reminded of how you once felt about the Lord. How there once was a fire in your belly. You once were a Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus, were not concerned about what was being done or what was needing to be done or time or, or cost anything but you've slowly slipped into a Martha where you're around Jesus ask yourself do, do you feel you know all of who Jesus is or are you focusing too much on one aspect of who he is master and Lord but forgetting his mercy and grace or he's full of grace and mercy and forgetting his reign and rule Heavenly Father we want to see your face this morning we want to see your face closed and head bowed if, if you this morning if you felt that there was just a moment where the loving gracious Holy Spirit of God 
just began to reveal areas that need to be refined, that need to be refreshed, a fire that needs to be rekindled and relit. And you'd say, this morning, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm going to slow down. I want to see Jesus for all he is. And that's you this morning. Would you just raise your hands? I just want to pray for you. Say, I've forgotten. Yes. Is there anyone else? Yes. 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 Jesus, I pray for every heart. That we would move from intellect, God, to spirit. not neglect your word. I pray, God, as you reveal yourself to a greater measure, that it would respond us to praise. It would lead us to a response of praise. It would would lead us to a, a place, God, where we'd have excitement in our hearts because we have spent time with you. Help us, Jesus, to fully understand to know you, God, to know you more. I'm going to ask those that raised their hands to do something very bold, and would you just come forward to the altar right now? And we're going to spend time worshiping the Lord, and if there's others that just would just like to move forward, we're going to end in singing Raise a Hallelujah, as I feel that that is the proper response to seeing Messiah, to seeing Jesus. And so if you raise your hand or you'd just like to come forward as we lift our voice as a one body, unified, we would, we would worship him and just take a moment in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, would you come forward?